Recording is on. Okay. Hey, everyone. Uh, I am uh, happy to be joined this morning for our, uh, for our class video by Dr. Josh Becker. I, I, I am asking him to, to come meet me early in the morning, and he requested the, the option to come in his pajamas, which I was happy to, to allow. Uh, Dr. Becker is a postdoctoral fellow at Northwestern. He's just about to start a job in the management school at the University College London. Uh, you can correct me if I get anything wrong, Josh. Uh, but he uh, he is has uh, did a PhD at uh, Annenberg Penn, so he's a communication scholar. Uh, he has lots of incredible publications. He's published in Science and multiple times in PNAS, which are really some of the kind of the top journals in the world. Um, he's kind of moving away, unfortunately, from communication to uh, the business side, but we'll forgive him. Uh, he, and he is the, the lead author on one of the papers that I had you read this week um, about collective intelligence. And, and he graciously uh, offered to come have a brief chat about the paper and about collective intelligence and next in communication. So thanks very much for, for joining us, Dr. Becker. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. And even though I'm, I'm now inside the walls and um, uh, administration of a business school, I'm still very much a communication scholar. My research is really focused on, on how we communicate as groups, as teams, as organizations to try to harness our potential as groups to solve problems and make decisions. So leaving the, the department, but not the question by any means. Good, good. Uh, so that, that's a great lead into the first question I had, which is, uh, you know, the, the article explains this a little bit, but in sort of more layman's terms, could you tell us what do you consider, like what is collective intelligence and wisdom of the crowds? Yeah, so that's a great question. And I personally make a pretty strong distinction between the two concepts. So you have collective intelligence, which I would say is a really broad set of processes or, you know, or bodies of research that's just interested very generally in how collectives can do things that seem intelligent. And I know that seems a little bit like a cop-out answer, but th that's actually the definition of collective intelligence given in the handbook on collective intelligence that comes out of the MIT Center for Collective Intelligence. And it's really intentionally a big tent uh, term to, to capture uh, all, any and all processes that we might be interested in. And what it's really motivated by is the observation that under many circumstances, groups simply can do things either better than individuals or things that that individuals even aren't capable of. So that's the, the motivation for collective intelligence research, which involves things like problem solving, innovation, coordination, brainstorming, decision making, democracy, all of all of that. And then the wisdom of crowds, I would say, is a much more narrow set of principles or phenomena that are focused very particularly on belief accuracy. So the wisdom of crowds is a phenomenon that a large group of people, if you ask them all the same question, so it could be something like, how many jelly beans are in this jar? Or how many cases of COVID-19 will be recorded in the United States by the end of this month? You know, any kind of numeric type trivia question is this incredible phenomenon that if you ask a whole bunch of people the same question, you can produce incredibly accurate answers or forecasts or predictions in the aggregate from the group as a whole, even when not one single person within the group has the right answer. It's pretty incredible sometimes. Yeah, thank you so much. That's that's great. So, so what would be an example? I think that's a great example of wisdom of the crowds. What would be an example of uh, collective producing collective intelligence? I mean, beyond this, kind of narrow forecasting type thing or within so the beyond wisdom, wisdom of the crowd. You said collective intelligence was broader. Yeah, sure, sure. What does that encompass? Yeah. So pre pretty much anything you can think of, uh, it's a bit of a wild west in terms of a research landscape right now. I mean, it's pretty new. There's just so many questions we haven't answered. So anything that you can think of that an individual could do as you know an intelligence task could get translated into something that a collective – 
uh, might try to do. I tend to break up the space just for my own uh, personal purposes in terms of thinking about it into three basic categories of tasks. So you have uh, idea generation. So we're, we've got some problems to solve and we're sitting around just coming up with ideas so that you think about things like brainstorming, right? You've got idea evaluation. So now we have some candidate idea that could solve this problem and we ask, how well will it work? So idea generation is gonna be brainstorming. What are all the different ways we might make a vaccine or design an intervention? How can we uh, come up with a strategy to trace people's networks and figure out who they've been in contact once they're infected? But once you have an idea, you have to evaluate it. So that would be like, uh, how many, what percentage of people do I think this vaccine will protect? Or, you know, what percentage of symptoms will this reduce? And that, that for me is sort of that wisdom of crowd space. And then you have idea selection, which right now seems to be one of the more overlooked areas in the space. So there's not as much research on it, but it, it's like once we have a whole bunch of ideas that we've come up with, once we've sort of figured out, you know, what each idea will do, and maybe there's some trade-offs, now we actually have to pick one. That last one, I think, is potentially one of the most interesting spaces because it's one of the ones that we don't always realize is happening. And that's where we start to see collective properties that simply don't occur in individuals. So if you think of something like social or technological conventions, right? Something like digital communication protocol uh, or IP, internet protocol, it's all standardized these days. But back in the 80s or early 90s, before there were widespread standards, companies who wanted to exchange information digitally with partners, they just had to figure out what the peers in their industry or the geographic region were doing. So a company in California or in the oil industry might use a completely different protocol than a company in New York or in the publishing industry because they're just matching their partners. But what turns out to happen is through this individual kind of peer-to-peer -peer interaction, we end up emerging on these global widespread standards without anybody actually sitting down and saying, okay, let's do this. There's no intention. It's truly an emergent collective process, but it ends up being like a decision because once something's widespread, we're pretty well locked into it. It's, it's very difficult to change an established convention. So we've got idea generation, idea evaluation, and idea selection. That's my rough mental map. That's great. Thank you, thank you, and yeah, we may get to this later, but you know, leads to some ideas about intersections between markets and norms and networks for sure, uh, and how those how those turn out, right? Absolutely, and especially in my research, but pretty much, I think the state of the art in the field is that whatever process you're interested in, people study it in their silo. Like, I get really good at understanding how groups uh, form beliefs or how groups complete a brainstorming process, but the reality is that they're all happening at the same time, right? Um, so the I think one of the big forefronts uh, of research and definitely one of the places I'll be uh, planning to go with my research is figuring out how these things overlap and, and intersect. Sounds sounds very exciting. Uh, so let's, let's dig in a little more on this specific study. Um, if you could just kind of walk us through like, what were you trying to find out? What was the goal? of this paper? Yeah, so this paper uh, had two primary goals. So, so the real key motivation for us was that at the time when we wrote this paper, and, and honestly, very much still this is true today, a common expectation for researchers and theorists and even practitioners working in this sort of, so more narrow wisdom and crowd space of belief accuracy was that in order to get uh, this wisdom of crowds phenomenon, these accurate group beliefs, you had to be collecting beliefs from people who are independent, right? You can't let them talk to each other. That's, that's the claim. And, and the concern is that when you let people talk to each other, they start to influence each other. You get hurting, you get group thinking, you get all these kind of negative effects that supposedly undermines the wisdom of crowds. Now, for us, that kind of flew in the face of both some other related academic work highlighting you know, the potential for collective intelligence, but also things like social learning, as well as they're just very intuitive and, and often practical 
understanding that teens and groups can work well together. So that was our initial motivation. We actually wanted to dig into this question and say, so what really happens when people communicate, right? When I can learn about what other people in my team or organization think, how does that shape me? And more importantly, on a statistical level, how does that shape the group as a whole? So that was our sort of basic motivation. It was almost like we had a, a bit of a bone to pick, a chip on our shoulder. We're like, yeah, that, that intuition, it's, it makes sense. Like, yeah, group think, but it doesn't quite sound right to us. So we wanted to dig into that. And the second was once we kind of open this can of worms, start asking this question of what happens when people communicate? Well, you all know that there's no simple communication, right? We can't just say people communicate. We have to start asking what's the structure of that communication, right? We know that you know people talking in one network and people talking in another structure of network isn't always the same thing. So we wanted to ask, once people start communicating, how does network structure shape the outcomes? And what uh, what did you find out? Kind of, uh, yeah. Yeah, so what is first of all, we found out that good news, in fact, when you let people talk to each other, let's say under optimal conditions, when you let people talk to each other under optimal conditions, not only is social influence not a bad thing, it's actually a good thing. Groups, not only do groups not get worse, but they positively become more accurate when their their members are able to observe each other's beliefs and learn from each other. And I'm saying observe each other's beliefs because I want to be really careful about what I'm claiming because what we were studying was very particular styles and methods of communication where we're really limiting the amount of information they can exchange with each other. And I think that's sort of key to resisting the hurting and groupthink dynamics. And then the other thing we found was that exactly as you'd intuitively expect, the network structure makes a huge difference. So if you're in a network where everybody's equally connected, so to use some technical terms, where everybody has the same degree centrality or eigenvector centrality, if, if everybody's equally central, that's where you get this beneficial kind of collective intelligence. But if you have networks that have what we call a high centralization coefficient, and you can maybe you've seen the Freeman centralization coefficient, you might also just be familiar with the Gini coefficient, right? How unequally distributed are these resources. When the influence is concentrated in the hands of just a few people, that's where you get all the risky effects associated with collective intelligence. Because what's essentially happening is when you have one or a few really dominant people, you're not getting the wisdom of the crowd anymore. You're getting the wisdom of the few or even the wisdom of the one. Yeah, so that, that leads to uh, one question I wanted to, to talk with you about, and that that's a, that this was, I mean, like like any experiment, was contrived in some respect. Networks were uh, either totally decentralized or totally centralized. They were created instead of emerging from people's, you know, chosen ch being chosen by the nodes in the network. They were anonymous, etc. Like there were a bunch of things about the networks themselves. They were not realistic, and and maybe in particular the one that, that you just discussed is that we know that many real world networks are uh, highly centralized in this, at least among degree centrality. Uh, that there's kind of preferential attachment type things going on, and so is this? Uh, I guess what are some what should we learn from this, and and what how do these uh, lessons apply to maybe real world networks? Yeah, and for me, this question really gets at the heart of the problem of social science, which is that when we study things in laboratory, it's really hard to know how they generalize to the real world. And when we study things in the real world, it's really hard to know why we're observing what we're observing, because we lack that experimental control. So for me, there's kind of, broadly speaking, two types of social science. There's social science that asks, what is actually going on in the world, right? The only way to answer that is to go out and look and see what people are doing. So that would be a question like, how do people currently make decisions in organizations? How do people use teams, right? This is asking about things that people are actually doing. And then there's the, soci the, the social science of what could happen, the social science of potential, of possibilities. Uh, I've heard this referred to as sociology on Mars, because what we're looking at here are really basic principles 
of human behavior. Something you can do in a lab under controlled circumstances, something you can pick up and take with you to Mars or take with you to another organization because you're really generating and creating that process. And what that's really good for is a couple of things. So yes, what did we learn from it? Well, one thing it's good for is this kind of basic science. There was this claim out there that was, it was just like, look, social influence is bad. Communication is bad. Don't even try it. It's just going to undermine your accuracy. So at the, at the most basic level, we're just asking, hey, is this always true, right? Is it always true that communication is bad? And in the lab, we were able to create a situation where communication was good. So we can point to that and say, look, it's simply not always true. At a basic theoretical level, we've learned something really valuable about how communication can happen or, 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 or you know, at least not uh, how it always happens, right? And then, and, and then the second level, beyond this basic science, we, we do actually want science to do something for us, right? Not necessarily today, right? There's a lot of value of basic science that you don't always necessarily know where it's going. But before I was a scientist, I was actually a practitioner. I was out of, after college, I worked for a while before going to grad school, and I worked as a, as a mediator. So that's things like conflict resolution, decision-making. I'm going into groups and facilitating processes to help them try to make a decision. And I went back to grad school because I kind of wanted to, to learn how to do it better. So what we've learned through this laboratory by saying, hey, this is possible. We've identified this possibility space. We can start to design interventions. We can think about things like organizational processes, where, which part of the reason I moved from communication department to a management department to still study communication is because within businesses, within organizations, they're like giant in vivo laboratories. The CEO can say, okay, you don't talk to each other anymore, right? They have that kind of authoritarian power to some extent. So you can take these laboratory processes and start to build them. And now we call them interventions or, or engineering principles, right? We can also think about, you know, it's much harder to carry through, but we can think about applying them to broader settings as well. Like one of the areas I'm really interested in as sort of a side project is deliberative democracy. So even though we're in these really simplified laboratory settings, we can think about what do these principles mean for how, how we might either theorize or even you know try to design or engineer a, a democratic system? Yeah, so that's that's a great maybe lead in. What what are some like applications or things that like design uh, interventions that you would suggest just based on so far on the results of this study? Yep, and I'm going to immediately walk back some of my comments now because even though uh as a as a i'm still a practitioner actually i still mediate pro bono for the chicago conflict resolution center as a practitioner you know it's really important to me to get these results but as a researcher i want to be sure that we're there yet and we can do a lot with basic science but it's going to take some more studies actually some of which i've done so to some extent i'm just saying this particular study hasn't answered at all um, but I'll, I'll tell you some things that I think we can be confident about, some things that are a little bit speculation. So one thing we can be confident about, which is kind of the least surprising finding, but it's core to the paper, is that if you want your organization or your democracy to have networks that generate uh, collective intelligence in this belief space, you need to, to try to make sure everybody's participating equally. We want to avoid those overly influential individuals. And the flip side of that is that if you look out at the world, you see that influencers, opinion leaders are everywhere. You've probably already covered in this network, or in this class rather, that one of the most, most universal properties of, of human social networks and indeed all networks is this scale free or, or power law distribution drop at the line here, right? Um, uh, so we know that empirically just influencers and opinion leaders are a fact of life. So it tells us that that's actually a really important thing that we should be thinking about. And it, and it gives us some concrete as evidence as to why and how those types of networks can be problematic. So if you're in an organization, you wanna devise principles. So one really simple principle, um, and I wish I could give credit to where I learned this, it was just a conversation. Someone was telling me about a, a study someone was actually doing on negotiation. They wanted to, to see if they could encourage turn taking in. Uh, negotiation, they just put a counter on the wall that showed how much time 
each person in the room had been talking. So now you imagine you've got a meeting with your 10 or 15 person committee, you're doing some wisdom and crowd side thing, maybe you're evaluating job candidates, you wanna say, you know, how good will this, this candidate be if we hire them? You got just clocks up on the wall that's tracking how much each person is talking. To me, that's one of those potentially subtle interventions that could end up putting us into this collective intelligence space by trying to mitigate influences. Now, one of the other things that, that I think is gonna be really important as we move forward is this question of how are people communicating? Not just the structure in terms of who's dominating conversation, but are we communicating through highly mediated digital processes, which is what our experiment was. So we didn't just let people talk to each other. We aggregated their responses, right? We shared them through this defined process. So are we, are we communicating through this highly mediated structured process or are we just gathering around the water cooler and having conversation? And you can imagine this whole space in between where we're maybe structuring processes, but still letting people communicate with natural language. So what I'm looking at right now is how the dynamics of group interaction shift across these different formats of communication. It turns out that when you just let people talk freely in a conversation, they tend to behave statistically just like those centralized networks. So what I'm, I'm working on now, and, I'm, and now I'm getting into the speculation territory, because now I'm getting to data I don't have yet, we have this idea that you can create networks that limit the emergence of influence leaders. So imagine you're in a group chat, uh, hopefully, you know, I imagine all of your students are, maybe you've got a group chat with Jeremy and Kedra and Josh and Shana, so that's, that's me and some personal friends, and then you've got a group chat with Joshua and Frank and you know Kurt. We're working on a grant together. That's a more professional network. So I'm in these two separate group chats. I'm a conduit for information flow between them. So we can start to try to create these macro structured networks that allow information diffusion, but really have people directly operating in these little mini personal networks. The idea, definitely speculating here, is that that will mitigate the potential ability for people to be these huge network-wide influencers, which will potentially allow the benefits of natural language communication while mitigating the risks of groupthink. So you can start to see how these laboratory studies, as you iterate them, right? We, with each study, we tweak one new thing, we change one variable, we try one different thing, which makes it a very slow process. But over time, these little iterations build up to some engineering principles or theoretical principles. That's great. I'll, uh, I'll end with kind of one follow on question. Oh, maybe, maybe a few, we'll see. Uh, but, but one is uh, how to word it. Like, does this suggest that, that we should, that we should limit the, that if we want to know something clearly, we need to limit the ways that we talk about it, that the more open and free conversation is always going to be like, what are the conditions? I, I, I guess that's kind of what, where you were going. Yeah. But, uh, you know, something like, I mean, maybe this is a, a good way to, to think about it. Something like Twitter or Facebook, is it likely to lead us to wrong conclusions about things? So, uh, I, yeah, I do want to acknowledge that a lot of this is very kind of preliminary findings, but I'm going to say yes. And and that's because, you know, we can see in things like Twitter and Facebook, you have these huge influencer effects. One of the other things that we're starting to look at is the role of incentives, right? So in these studies, as you read, we're incentivizing people to be accurate. We're literally paying people more, the more accurate they are. That's not happening on Twitter. On Twitter, there's really almost an incentive to be provocative. Right, so we're 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 seeing sort of the opposite of uh, types of forces driving dynamics. So I think that the format and the 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 medium for communication, both through these more structural properties like the the way the statistics unfold or the way the network is structured, as well as these higher level things like the incentives, the communication medium will have a huge effect on whether you're in the collective intelligence territory or the group think and hurting territory. Yeah, okay, that's that yeah, that's really helpful. 
uh, maybe the final question then is that that these uh, you, your study and most of our discussion today has been focused around the the overall kind of group conclusions. Um, like under what conditions do individuals have get better or <laughs> worse in their beliefs or you know the what when are these dynamics good for individuals or bad for individuals? Okay, I love that question. So I have a paper I'm kind of sitting on because it's on it's on the back burner right now. But you're right. So what we figured out so far is that like you can get these collective intelligence benefits for groups, but you have to like structure it really carefully. What we're finding, uh, and this is theoretically driven, but it, it emerges as we start to look over all of these different studies. The the benefits of information exchange to individuals are really robust. So under nearly any circumstances, even if the group as a whole gets worse, individuals within the group on average get better. And that emerges from what at the end of the day is a really simple statistical principle. So I didn't mention this earlier, but underneath the wisdom of crowds is a mathematical fact. And it's mathematically guaranteed that the average answer in a group is at least as accurate as uh, an average individual, which is to say the error of the average is at least as small as the average error of individual. So if you were to randomly select an individual and compare them against the group, the group is always gonna do at least as good as the randomly selected individual on average. So that's the mathematical fact. So we, now we know this group average is, is better than people on average, which means as people converge towards that group average, they're simply, mathematically guaranteed to get better. So if people just, that distribution collapses, it does nothing for the group. The average is the same, but people get better. And then we can look at that under different kind of statistical circumstances and say, even when the group gets worse, just because of that really strong principle, uh, people still tend to get better. So no matter what else is going on, talk to your friends, listen to your friends, listen to your professor, listen to your parents, go out there and get some advice. Make sure you're getting it from a larger network, right? You want to try to, you need to have that crowd, as it were, to get your wisdom of the crowds, but uh, take advantage of your, your peers for the opportunity for some social learning. Even if it undermines the group as a whole, it'll benefit you, probably, in expectation. <laughs> that's, I think that's a great place to end. Thank you so much, Dr. Brecker. Really, really, really appreciate it. All right, Jeremy, this was a real pleasure. It was a lot of fun. I hope uh, everybody's doing well and that um, everybody's you know, staying safe and being healthy. Thanks, Josh. All right.